So Chris just stole the first minute of my talk. I'm Jacob. Uh, this is the Gringo's Guide to Internationalization. And uh, the goal of this uh, talk is not so much to kind of like document every single feature and everything you can do with internationalization, but it's to kind of to bridge a gap between not, know, not only not knowing anything about Git text or PO files, but not knowing anything about other languages in general and to being able to translate a website. Um, so I'm an engineer at Revolution Systems. I'm currently working for a client called uh, Kashtar, and I spearheaded their internationalization efforts. And I have three years of C-grade high school Spanish because I come from Los Angeles, which means I am a full-fledged gringo. And this sounds like it's just a joke to make translations not so dull, and it 80% is. Um, but it's also important to know, I, when I was asked, oh, we need to translate this website, uh, it was scary to me because not only do I not know how to, did I not know how to do that, I didn't know the first thing about uh, languages. I didn't know how to do this. I knew Ola, I know Miyamo Hakobo, but <laughs> which I can only half say. Uh, but I didn't know how to go there, and it's daunting because you read the either the Git text docs, the GNU Git text docs, which are scary, or the Django internationalization talks, which are docs, which are much better but they still have this inside baseball thing. It's like, of course we know how to translate a website. Here's how to do it in Django. And I'm kind of hoping to, to bridge that gap. So uh, briefly, I did this for, like I said, a client called Kashtar. They sell uh, online gift cards to a giant number of brands and kind of just act as that middleman so the brand doesn't have to sell it themselves and adds a lot of features uh, into the process itself. And what I did was this, and it's small, uh, but I think you get the idea is the top is English and the bottom is French, and all that text is in French. But how do we get from point A to point B, especially with someone like me who doesn't speak another language uh, well or uh, didn't have anything to know with Git text? Um, so how I approached this was I just had a lot of questions and I just Googled a lot, I figured out a lot of stuff, and I'm hoping to kind of encapsulate a lot of the trickier things or things that threw me off guard uh, to you guys. Uh, probably the biggest question that I have, when I've told people what the answer is without them asking, they go, oh, I never knew what that is. Uh, so that is this. That stupid little acronym is the greatest and worst acronym ever. It is as simple as it's the letter I, a bunch of letters, 18 of them in varying shapes, and the letter N, and that's what I18N is. It's nothing fancy, it's no, I always thought it was like a government approved acronym that this is how you translate a website, and I was wrong, and it's a lot stupider than that. But it makes it a lot nice, so you have to type 20 characters uh, all the time. So this is, a, it says git temp example, but it should probably more say PO file example. This is the, your, the heart of your translation. You Django can generate a file, you mark in some translations, it'll tell you where those files are located, and this is it. It's that stupid, it's that easy, it's nothing fancy, it is a plain text file that gets compiled and it looks like this. But how do we get there? How do we generate this file? Um, what do we do once we have the translations and how do we go, um, what do we do after that? So this is the life cycle of a PO file and we'll go into detail on all the tools on this step a little bit later, but let's kind of get a kind of an overhead view. Um, first, and this is probably the hardest step or the most intensive step, is you wrap everything in a PO, uh, in a um, function call. You have Python files, you have HTML files, maybe you have JavaScript files, uh, and you're just wrapping all your text that you need translated in some sort of function call. Uh, these function calls do two things. They, one, let Django know this is something I need to pull into a PO file when you run a management command, and it also actually does the translation. There are no op versions of these function calls um, in case you wanted to mark, be able to pull things into a PO file but not actually do the translation. But generally, you shouldn't need to know them, uh, excuse me, use them. They are there if you need them, but the overhead of doing a translation tends to not uh, be something to worry about too much. And then you run this management command. You pass in an argument saying everything, every language uh, you want translated, and a PO file per language is generated with all of the text, all the strings you just marked, and nothing, uh, nothing in their message string, nothing as a translated uh, string. You deliver that to somebody. This is easy. This is an email. This is sending it to a third-party service. It's something that someone that actually knows a language uh, can actually translate it for you, so you're not responsible for using your you know, C-level Spanish to actually fill this all in. Over a few days, you'll receive something back. Hopefully, it's a few days. Uh, and then you just substitute the Django PO file. Again, really easy. 
and then you compile it. This changes the PO file into an MO file, which is a binary format that uh, makes uh, the lookups really easy. And then you're done. Really the only hard step is adding the function calls and maybe in compile messages, maybe the file you got back has a smart quote because they used Word or it has something weird in it that you need to kind of troubleshoot. But other than that, it's really easy, right? It seems easy, it feels like something we should be able to do. And yet it, it gets harder. But let's start talk about the easy stuff. So we have this locale middleware. Uh, Django comes with it. It comes pre, uh, pre-listed within your middle, middleware classes settings. All this does is runs through all the data it has access to in the request and figures out what language should I use for this user. We'll go into how that works a little bit more in depth later because subclassing local middleware is one of the best advanced techniques we have, but that, I want to talk about that uh, uh, in 10 minutes or so. We have template tag and Python methods. These are your bread and butter. Uh, these are your git text, your git text lazy, and Python land, and your trans, and your block trans, and uh, HTML land. This is by far what you will largely be interfacing with and in getting to know uh, as you um, become a fully fledged internationalization dude or dudette, I should say. Um, and then make messages, like I said, it's a very simple command. It looks for translations and makes a PO file out of them. Nothing much to say there. You can pass it in a domain. Uh, JavaScript translations are stored differently uh, than your main translations largely keep that JavaScript file down. But it's nothing, nothing too fancy there. So the first question is when you look at other translation code, you'll see Get text lazy get imported a lot. Uh, get text imported sometimes, always, almost always imported with uh, as an underscore. Just cut down on the amount of typing you're doing. Um, so the question is, what's the difference? How do they work? Get text will return a string. It will always return a string. It will attempt to translate uh, what the text you give it right away. If you type in hello and you have a valid translation, you get hola. If you type in hello and you don't, you get hello. And now if you use lazy, you get a proxy object. This is actually really similar if you're familiar with how Django off attaches user to the request. Works very similar in that it attaches, it returns a proxy object that never gets resolved, never actually becomes a useful string until string or Unicode is called on it. This is useful because if you're in models, if you're in forms, if you're in settings, if you're anything that Django loads before it actually has access to a request, it doesn't know what language to use, and it won't actually translate it well if you try to use git text. Git text lazy holds that off until a string evaluation occurs, and hopefully that's uh, after you actually have access to a request. So here's a few best practices and the things that, just questions that I ran into a lot. You should almost always use git text lazy um, because it's just convenient. There's a slight overhead, but it's, not, it's super marginal and it just allows you to know safely I have the language I want. Even if I have, you have access to the request at the beginning, something you do along the way may change what language you want to use. Uh, so the later you do it, the better. If you see something like django-utils.functional.underscore-underscore-proxy-underscore-underscore with a bunch of um, hex letters after that, it's because you tried to use a lazy object and evaluate it in a way that wasn't a string and wasn't a Unicode. Um, Repr will do this. And then you'll see it in your debug code, you'll see it in the HTML, it will look really ugly. All that means is you need to wrap that particular uh, string and a, you, probably a Unicode function call. Uh, as I said in the last slide, you should import it as underscore so you don't see git text on, you know, if you have 200 fields on models file, you don't want to see it all over the place. So import it as underscore. If you need both, that's kind of rare. Uh, you should, based on what kind of file you're using, you should probably need one or the other. That said, I use underscore and underscore lazy to differentiate the two and also avoid all the rep repetition in git text. You could also just repeat it the same because since you're probably only using one uh, slightly. Template tags, this will probably be, this was my first introduction to internationalization. We had, I worked on a project that just had them, had no translations, but it was future-proofing a lot better than I ever did. So it would import it and use trans everywhere. And that's, I'm like, oh, that must automatically, I don't know, hit Google Translate and do it that way. No, it doesn't do that. It just marks things as for translation. Um, trans is for short tags. It's, uh, you're actually passing in the string as an argument as opposed to it being a block code. So you're using that for anything simple, anything that doesn't have any variables, and you lose block trans, which is a block tag for everything else. Um, just a few hints on that. If you can use trans, it'll just, it just looks cleaner and uh, it's a good default setting because you'll, you'll kind of know, oh, the string's too long oh, this string has a variable, uh, I should use block trans. 
That said, when you use Blocktrans, don't go crazy with it. Uh, it's really easy to say, oh, I need access to eight variables in this Blocktrans. Let me use a bunch of uh, with statements to kind of get that in there. And it's also easy to say, oh, Blocktrans, enter, 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 enter. But type in a bunch of HTML, enter, 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 and block trans. The problem with the white space issue is that Git text can be finicky with what it thinks is the same translation and what isn't. So if you have a giant block and then someone goes in and cleans up the white space, it may get marked as a completely different translation and you have to retranslate it or remove the lazy flag. Um, and it's just not something you uh, want to do. So this is a bad example of block trans. <clears throat> you, anything that requires um, uh, basically a dot, any attribute lookup, or anything that's using, say, I don't, don't have an example here, but a template filter needs to be put into the block trans ahead of time. And if you have five of these, it gets really hard to read. And then we have the white space, which uh, I mentioned why to remove that before. This is better uh, because you're removing uh, the variables a little ahead, it's a little easier to read, and you're able to reuse that user variable. I'm missing the end width, but you get the idea of you can now use that user within your block trans things that cuts down on the code and makes it a little bit readable. Even better would be to say, hey, this user thing that I'm calculating in the, uh, in the template, maybe I should calculate that in the view or a context processor. And that way you just have access to it. You don't need to do anything fancy. You don't need to use a whiff tag and it's just there for you. So these are the basic building blocks, uh, simple stuff that you just use a lot to kind of build up your PO file. So you build up that PO file, you've got 200 translations, you sent it off, you got it back, you've deployed with it, you're feeling great, but this is how things actually go and this is why translation is actually a lot harder problem than it, it kind of sounds like. So first you get told by somebody who doesn't speak English that they see English somewhere on the website that you weren't planning for and now you have to find that string. So you find it, you wrap it, make messages again. Now you have a PO file that has all the translations you had before and a few that don't. Now you have to find where those missing ones are within the PO file itself. Maybe you wrote a regex, maybe you wrote something to find it. You find it, you write it in, you, or excuse me, you copy and paste just those translations, you send those to the translation company. They come back, um, let me get there. And then uh, you get it back, you recompile, you put it back up, and then someone in marketing says, no, 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 we need these two other phrases put in. And then you remember these phrases actually exist in the database uh, and you don't know how to pull that. You, you think about it, you think there's probably a fancy way to do it, you, don't, you sweat about it and you decide, you know, screw it, I'm just gonna manually add it to the PO file, which you're gonna sh hate yourself for doing later, but you do it anyways. And then someone else, so you do that and then someone else comes by and they say, they can't, there's these other things that you can't translate and this kind of keeps going. I actually can kind of click a while. I wrote more than fit on the screen. No, oops, there we go. Um, so Pox, Pox is a tool written originally by um, a demigod of Python, uh, Ned Batchelder, uh, and he wrote it for the first problem, which is a huge problem. I am a gringo, I don't know how to translate. I have this PO file, I've marked a bunch of strings for translations, but I need to send a translation company and I kinda wanna do that in one group because if I keep going to them, they're gonna find a way to charge me a lot. But I don't have a good sense of, say, coverage. I don't understand, I don't have, I can't confidently say my entire site's translated because they're not translated yet. So what Pox will do is it will replace, say, hello, or in this case, your photo, with a bunch of ugly 14-year-old script kitty Unicode hacker uh, letters. And that way, when you load up your site, it's really easy to tell, oh, that looks normal strain. I need to find where that is and mark it as translated. Um, and that way, it's not perfect because maybe there's a part of your website you just forgot about. There's some link to some FAQ you forgot about and you're gonna miss that no matter what you do. Um, but this will allow, I, I'd say 20% of the first PO file we wrote I found because of this, um, and it just helps a lot. Uh, what I added to Pox uh, when I threw it up on GitHub is this, I, excuse me, GitHub, is this idea of a, um, a canonical PO file. Uh, this is uh, in my attempt to solve that iterative process where you have to find the new translations, send only those to the translation company. Um, so what you do is you have a canonical file. This is the translations you have gotten from the translation company, you know are good, and you put them in canon.po, or whatever you want, you can call it whatever you want, instead of Django.po. You then run pox against your uh, Django uh, PO file, passing in the canonical file, uh, and it will munge everything that is not in the canonical file, and then use what's in the canonical file for those. Uh, if you pass in the blank, uh, there's a blank flag that I don't have on the slide. Instead of munging it, it will just mark those translations as not translated. 
You can also pass in a diff flag, and this is probably the most useful thing. What this will do is it will basically make a blank MTPO file with only the translations that don't exist in your canonical file. This is the file you can ship your translation company real, relatively easy. Uh, we're using this in production for cash jar and have been for, I want to say, four or five months now, and it works a whole lot better than our process before. So dynamic translations, stuff that was in the database. I don't have a good answer for you. There are answers. They all suck. Um, it, and it's, if you go to anyone in the international community, uh, I, I see Jonas nodding, uh, Giannis uh, uh, Yezdez on Twitter uh, basically has told me this. There's no good way to do it. Um, I wish I had a better answer. <laughs> uh, Cashstar has a use case and there's a tool for it that is uh, the shiniest duct tape for us, but it has its clear uh, downfalls, but it's Django DB get text. What this does is you write a class of metadata that says these are the models, these are the fields that I need translated, and you run a management command, it hits that database, pulls every value for those fields into um, a file with a self-documented file name, and you edit those PO files, and that's where your translation lives. It, it, excuse me, it, it's a blank Python file uh, with a bunch of git text wrappers around it, and then you ru rerun make messages and it pulls them into your PO file. It works for CacheStar because we don't need to change the values of the database all that often. It's maybe two or three times a year, but if you're changing this once a week, this isn't going to work. You don't want to recreate a PO file, resend it, re-get it back. You want a nice admin, this is what everyone wants, so you want a nice admin interface where you type it in and it enters the database as it comes back out. There's no great solution for this out of the box. Um, but that said, um, let's dive a little deeper and see if we can understand the kind of core crux of Django's internationalization code to get an idea of maybe how we could implement this cells. I'm not going to show that because I, I never had to do it, so I haven't had the thought of, excuse me, think of every little gotcha that, that could come up from it. Um, but I am going to show you a few other things that we had to do at Cashstar that is actually uh, uh, pretty cool. So loca metaor, let's go back to this. Before, all I said was uh, that it's simple and it assigns um, all the variables you need to know on how, what language you should be serving to a user. Um, but how it works uh, is critical to understanding how we're later gonna subclass it and kind of hack it to do it what we wanna do. So uh, first, you should know that uh, the language is determined first by URL path. That's new in Django 1.4. Uh, there's great docs on it. I'm not going to go too heavily into it. Um, and then prior to Django 1.4 or right after that is session code. Um, you can, there's a view that comes with Django where you can say, I know the user's browser says it wants French, but it really wants English, and this user wants English, um, so use that. Likewise, you can, use a you can have a cookie file. Probably the most used one, especially when your user first comes to your site, is the accept language header, which if you're a gringo like me, you didn't know existed, and it does, you can go into Chrome. Um, they keep changing where it's located in Chrome, but it's somewhere in their languages. You move up, and I recommend everyone here do this. Move your re top language to French, to Spanish, to Korean, do something, and just browse the web for a day and notice who's really good at translating this. I'll let you know who Google is, and who is not. Um, and you'll see that it's, if you're struggling with this, you're not the only person struggling with this. Um, so it's something, just something cool to do. And then if all else fails, it doesn't get an accept language header, doesn't get any of this. It just uses what's in your, uh, what's in your settings file. So the, the bulk of the translation code, and actually the code that calculates what we just said for local middleware, isn't located in locale middleware. It's located here. Django utils translation transreal. This is the file if you think you need to do something a little hacky, a little special. Uh, this is a file you want to read as much as you can. There are some gross code in here. There's no doubt about it. Um, it's a lot of like string manipulation and list manipulation, so it can get scary. But try and read it and try and understand it as much as you can. The thing that you should know most is the, translate, the Django translation class is actually the only class in here, which is a little scary. Uh, but it's a thin wrapper around GUN translations. Not translation, translations. The reason why it's plural is that a translation is actually a merge of a bunch of PO file. This makes sense if you think about it because Django has its default PO file. This is where a lot of the translation code from uh, the admin lives, any of the translations from the contrib apps live. Uh, you have your own translation file and you also have any third-party apps that actually are nice enough 
to include some translations, they'll go on there, and then they need to get merged in a helpful order. This is really important. This is actually probably the last thing I actually noticed about uh, translation when I was diving in deep, and it helped save my butt and uh, something we'll get to. It also has a lot of utility functions. The two that are most useful to me, two that I almost wrote on my own and I discovered they were there, is going from a dash-based uh, language code to a underscore-based locale code. Uh, locale code always includes both language code, may just include EN, and may not have the US. Is, uh, there's code in there for it, you don't need to write it yourself. But there's a lot of other utility codes in there um, and it's worth reading to see if your problem has been solved within the core itself first. So a little bit more about, before I get examples, uh, two examples I have on how we can kind of hack and kind of customize the locale framework is just an idea of how um, the back end of what powers I-18 and Django. And the answer is thread locals. Um, what, what a translation is, is it's that Django translation class gets assigned to a thread local underscore translation, which is located within this file. And then you, there's activate and deactivate code. All that is is swapping out what is the active value for that thread local in and out. Um, and this is important, uh, really important because it makes it really, it feels a little dirty if you have things against thread locals because it feels like it shouldn't be that easy to swap out what you're translating, but it is. So the first problem we ran into in Castro that we needed a little uh, hackiness is, um, like I said, Best Buy uh, wanted to translate their site into French, um, but the problem is Best Buy has a lot of custom text, so while about maybe 80% of what we translated for them would translate to other brands, 20% of it won't, wouldn't, and that looks really gross when you just have this English sentence in the middle of nowhere. And it was decided that it's best to not translate it at all unless we had a full good uh, test, or not test coverage, uh, translation coverage. So how I did this is, in, I, we're not using locale middleware anymore, we're using basically a mo slightly more customized version of this. If, I, if my URL is in this settings file, uh, excuse me, settings variable, then do the normal thing, figure out what language I should be using. Otherwise, don't bother with it. My language code is what my default one is, and I don't want you to try anything else. And this works. I, I was actually put up a big fight when I was asked to do this because I thought it would be hacky, I thought it would be dirty, I thought it would break, and this just works. Oh, I feel like Steve Jobs, I feel good. Um, and then site-specific translation. So this is when, okay, Best Buy's translated, it's awesome, it's in French. But we have another brand, they also want French, but certain words, they don't want to use the same thing. They maybe have a copyrighted term for the idea of a gift card, or they have something that they just, they want, phrased slightly differently in French, um, maybe ch the idea of what a checkout is. Uh, so what this does is you have a folder somewhere, and all this code I'm gonna put up on GitHub uh, later tonight so you don't feel like you actually need to read it too heavily, but the, the crux of this is you have a folder somewhere that is site-specific translations. You somehow denote through a domain name that this is Best Buy's translation file, and because translations are just totally mergeable, you merge that on top of what the pre-existing stack is. And that way, whatever is in there gets precedence. So I don't like the word sucks, and it becoming too cliche, I think. So I'm going to say uh, this, wh where I think the internationalization can get improved. And the answer is um, a lot. There's a lot that can be improved. Um, we have this use I18N setting, which feels so stupid. Like, why do I need to turn that off and on? It's to avoid the overhead. I guess, but while you can still mark things for translation, but it seems so crufty that that, along with the localization equivalent uh, L10N, is just there. Um, there's a ticket for this, 14974, which goes into <clears throat> all of this, and it uh, tries to explain that we need uh, easy access to dynamic tr translations, we need to be able to swap things in and out, uh, we need to be able to, uh, if I don't want to use GitText and I want to use something else, uh, be able to define that easily. Um, no one is, it is, this has actually been accepted. It's no longer in design decision required. Just no one's spearheading it yet. Uh, if no one does in a month, I will. Um, but if you would like to help, come see me after and let me know what you want in there and how, if you have any ideas behind it. Um, and I'm hoping to uh, in, recruit some help and, uh, and get that going. Uh, done early, which is good, because I hope there are questions. I hope there are things I didn't cover. There are a bunch of uh, URLs of the stuff I mentioned. 
Uh, the first one is blank right now, but I have a repo I'm just kind of cleaning up and making sure, getting approval from powers that be that I can throw that code in there. And that should be up there uh, later than night. Any questions? Um, so I have a question which is uh, about uh, projects that uh, fairly large project, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, what uh, we are doing is that we are maintaining a translation file uh, in each application. Our project is structured with about 60 applications. Uh, and uh, the problem is that we have a lot of redundancy between these files because often the same word will be used by different mm -hmm. applications. Uh, but if we had a single PO file, if we would take around 10 or 15,000 lines, <laughs> which would be unwieldy. Uh, so do you have advice for dealing with this situation? I want to uh, pretext this by saying our translation file is about 12,000 lines. <laughs> so um, yes and no. Um, I don't have anything off the bat, but that said, if, my gut, if I had to deal with that, is that feels like something um, that can go into pox, something that could say, like, what your final Django PO file is, is this monolithic scary thing, but it pulls it in from a bunch of resources. That feels like something a tool like that should be able to handle and handle well. It, it doesn't right now, but knowing the POC source, um, it, I would guess it would take a day or two to add. And that, to, me that, to me, that's where uh, my gut is, is that Git text, because it's old and it likes this monolithic PO file, it's best to try and keep it there as opposed to a, a bunch of merges but then write a tool to help you separate that logic out. So um, the URL's there if you wanted to look at it and try and do it yourself. If not, that might be something I do if you wanted to pay me about it, because it actually sounds, like I said, with our big PO file, that actually sounds something like I kind of want to do now, so. So just for information, we've written a tool to compare our PO files and check for inconsistent translations to avoid, uh, well, to be deterministic at least. But once again, it, it sucks a bit. So may, indeed, uh, I agree that the single PO file is probably a better idea overall. It, I, like I said, I think keeping, at least having what Git text looks at be a single one is the way to go. Um, that said, I think there should be a way to separate things in the uh, applications without running into that redundancy. But it's not a problem I've had to deal with exactly, at least not yet. Uh, all the stuff you talked about is for translating text. I know obviously you shouldn't put text inside of an image, but there are other cases where you might want sure. non-text images to change, like maybe if a picture of a flag or your site's a different color in France or who knows sure. what, right? Or maybe you have text inside of a JavaScript file or something like that. Uh, what do you generally do to deal with those kind of situations? So JavaScript, real quick, um, Django has really good built-in, not only support for JavaScript, but docs, so I didn't talk about it too much. Um, we are using it, um, I, I, I kind of hate to do this, but the docs handled that specific thing really well. Images are harder, because uh, you could put a URL in your PO file. That feels super gross. Um, what I actually like to do for that, and I actually totally forgot to add it to this slide, so maybe I'll do it post facto so I seem smarter, um, is, uh, the, the other use case that is very similar to that is, say, terms and condition uh, FAQ pages, these things that are just, just text. That's all they are. And what we actually did is we wrote um, our own version of the render uh, shortcut and of the include template tag. And that will, you include FAQ.html or you um, render FAQ.html, but it will use you, the language code and then if a FAQ underscore, and this, uh, FAQ underscore FR dot HTML exists, load that instead, otherwise use the English one. And I feel like what might be best for images, we haven't ran into that exactly, but it's something similar where it's a, a maybe a template tag to where it says maybe a, a wrap around the URL template tag or a media template tag where it's just the URL, but it also, it would be a little crufty, but I guess attempt to append an underscore FR to it. Obviously, that's a problem if you can't guarantee that. You'd have to, like, do a, I don't know. I don't want to think about that. That would be really dirty. Uh, um, but something like, um, luckily for us, the images, any images that are specific are in a header. Um, and that way, we, can, we use the include and um, render on that header itself. And that way, we just include a French version of that header, which has all of the French images on it. 
Obviously, if it's more spread out, that's a much harder problem, um, and I don't have a wonderful solution for it. Okay, cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi. I think you actually kind of answered my question, talking about the FAQs and so on. Our, mm -hmm. uh, our online contract is composed of all these different things, that, all these different separate templates that might get pulled in depending on where you live or what you yeah. ordered, so on and so forth. Um, and, and I feel like wrapping, yeah, this entire 17-paragraph TNC um, in a block trend is probably kind it of is a big It's a terrible waste. idea. It's an so, awful idea. <laughs> you, like, if, if, when you start using block trends, look in your PO file because you'll, your message ID is that entire block, and that will make you feel so gross when you have to change a CSS tag, and boom, your thing's broken. So I completely agree. That code will go, it's all written. I just need to dot my I's and make sure I'm allowed to open source it. I, I am, I just need to make sure in its form, and it'll go up in there. But it's really a nice technique around it, is just including it in a trans render uh, function file, or function. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking as a fellow gringo who has barely functional German, um, I, I have enough German to know that there are all sorts of pluralization and, and gender issues when you get with just about any language other than English. Yeah. And that affects the way that you construct the statements that are going to be translated. Um, because you can't just pick a word that you want to translate, you have to pick a phrase and pick a phrase that can be, that has sufficient context that the, the translation will know which tense or gender yeah. pronoun needs to happen. <laughs> Have you got any advice about what, any to-dos, not to-dos, about how to approach that problem? It's, <laughs> the answer is only kinda. Um, it, it, it's hard, right? Especially when you get into tense, it's actually something we're struggling with right now. Um, the best solution I can, I, I've found, and it's not a good one, is to try and variable things as much as you can. Um, so you have a past tense verb variable, you have, Obviously, the first advice is to avoid as much as you can, which sucks. But that said, um, trying to have access to as much variations as possible. So you have, it, it's in certain cases of um, adjectives, for instance, are hard because we have this noun, and it's a very universal noun, and it's just in a bunch of variables. And then in English, it's pretty version of that noun, but in Spanish, it would be you know, that noun, de bonita, we've got something, or it's at, added at the end, and it becomes really, really tough. And it's another problem that I feel like get text does not solve well. And I think the only real thing I can say is do the hackiest thing that sounds nice to you, and then hopefully give me advice when I write this, hopefully, 1.5 or 1.6 Django thing so that we can improve on pawn get text and not be tied to the weird quirks of get text so we can actually have something useful. Do you have any advice for people that are working on reusable applications that want to make sure that it's inter internationalization friendly other than mark everything for translation? I mean, um, ways to help translators or, or try to get translators because Many of them probably can't do the translation themselves. So, so it, it, it does depend, and this is where I do uh, thank Kashtar for saving me from a little bit of this, because, so two things. Mark everything for translation. Use POX to mark things so you know you, you've caught a lot of coverage. Um, but then we hired a really good translation company, and they were able to, to, like, in a day, give it back. We threw it up there, and they said, oh, no, no, this isn't going to work, this isn't going to work. If you don't have access to the funds at the, that cost, um, it's a lot harder. There are um, third-party tools and websites. And uh, Jonas, do you want to? Transifex. Transifex, thank you. Uh, that 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 can help a lot. Um, and but obviously that this, that's only internationalization. You also might have to worry about localization, which I don't get, go into at all, obviously. Um, but honestly, if you're if you're caring. That's a good first step. Like it really is. You would be surprised at like how hard it is to translate a good project well afterwards. Um, mark, but mark things out. Throw things on Transfex. See what's available to you on, on there, and then throw out a feeler to see if there's just uh, whether it be a user group or. It, 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 I, I guess what I'm saying it's very domain specific. It depends on what money you have access to. It depends on. Uh, what's the community around you? Maybe like Django. Maybe you have 
you know, German people who are happy to look at your site in German for you and tell you what looks weird. Um, so uh, maybe, maybe after the talk, you can come talk to me and we'll see what you have access to. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of goes with what he was asking was, um, and you hit on it too. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> to continue what he, uh, the question he asked, and you kind of hit on it. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, here? Oh, okay. there you go. There, sorry. There you go. Um, so I guess could you maybe suggest a few things as to how to migrate an existing code base that's not internationalization friendly? Um, uh, pick your deity of choice. I don't know. Uh, it, it's tough, right? Um, but that said, pick, pick a day, grab a caffeinated beverage of choice, and just mark everything. Start with the things you want to start, template files, models files, forms files. Start there. Um, and then run pox over it and see what you're missing. You're going to cover most ground there, um, and those are pretty straightforward, especially model field name. It's just there. Trends, uh, templates are annoying to wrap that much, especially if you're using a lot of template logic. Excuse me. Um, but just like bite down and do it. <laughs> and then um, you'll get, that'll get you a pretty good base. It'll probably get you 60 to 70 percent there. And then the other 30 percent is just going, oh, that's located in a weird middleware. Let me make sure I wrap that and wrap it correctly. Hi. Hello. Um, I'm not sure if this is a question about internationalization or localization, because <laughs> I'm a little fuzzy about the difference. But um, I would think that if you're displaying a date and a time to users on your website, if that user was in Australia, they may want to see that date and a time in the format that they're mm -hmm, accustomed sure. to. Um, can you speak to how Django helps you solve that problem? Sure. Um, I, may, I may cheat here a little bit. Uh, it, that is localization, but it is, uh, that's actually the part I know. The part I don't know is, uh, is uh, right to left. I, I haven't had to translate into Hebrew. so. I, if you have any questions about that, I don't have your answer. Um, it's uh, really easy, uh, and I'm not going to pull up source code because it may that may be bad. Um, but basically, there's a each language has a predefined setting, um, and I'm actually forgetting what they're called right now. I'm looking at Russ, he doesn't know. Um, but it basically it says of accepted form date formats or time formats for that particular um, locale, and it'll be a giant list of we accept. MD, MDY, or uh, and we accept YMD, you know, all these uh, little things. So you can override that and, uh, and place, this is what I want to do. Um, and then anytime you use um, Django's built-in date time, whether it be models or forms, it should render it correctly based on what locale you're doing. Just by default, it just magically works. Um, now that may, you're going to run into issues if you have any JavaScript that's assuming a certain format. Uh, but dealing with that, like I said, is adding this settings file. And um, find me afterwards, and I can show you source code. And it's easy. OK, so just so I, I understand what you mm -hmm. said. So if you had a field that was a date, time, and a model, and in the template, you just If you print it, it, it should out. be rendered. It should render it correctly, nicely. Okay. It's actually a very magic on how it works. Awesome. Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Just run out of time for the session cool. there. Cool. Thank you, everybody.